yield ourselves to you right now in Jesus' name. All glory and honor to you. Amen and amen. sing that together. Then sings my soul, my Savior God.
Praise the Lord. Sing his praises together. Amen. I tell you what, what a 
The song talks about freedom. What a free thing that is to be able to come into this place and worship the true and mighty King. And yeah, dance around a little bit till you can't sing. <laughs> hey, if you're not out of breath by the end of that song, you're doing something wrong. I'm just telling you. So we're here to give glory to the King Most High, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to Him and Him alone. And we say, God, to you be the glory. Not unto us, not unto us, but unto you be the glory. You know, part of that worship, we get together and we sing, we sing songs. I think that's a great part of worship. Our lives should be our worship. And we should view ourselves as ministers of the God Most High. And remember the high calling on our lives on Tuesday afternoons as well as on Sunday mornings. We should just desire to use those things He's given us to give Him glory. I do want to give a little praise to uh, Myrna and embarrass her while she's here on the platform this morning. That uh, she and Olivia both uh, sang this weekend and, and on their way to state choir and out of nearly 500 students, she made sixth chair on her way to progress to the next level. I don't know if anybody had any doubts about that. I didn't. But what I want to say is how awesome that is for God to give you a gift like that and give a young person a gift like that. Got another one sitting right back here behind me. Will yeah. Conway on the drums. Woo. And how, how awesome it is for God to give a young person a gift and, and yes, they're going and pursuing great things academically, and they're pursuing great things through the avenues of, of school, as we should be in our jobs and in our lives and in the natural things that we do, but yet cultivating those gifts to give back to God because that's truly why He gave us the gifts He gave us. He's empowered each one of us and wired us each up in certain ways to serve Him in specific ways. You know, so if you got that wild and crazy young teenage boy that you can't hardly corral. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing wrong with that boy. God wired him up a certain way and he's got a powerful, powerful ministry and a powerful purpose for that child. And the same thing for that one that might be quiet and stand over in the corner most of the time. And well, why don't they enter into that thing? And why don't they play that sport? And why don't they, you know what? God wired them up in a specific way for a specific ministry, for a specific calling. And, and so it's our job as the church and it's our job as parents to cultivate that in them, to seek God and all of us collectively to just stir them up toward their giftings, encourage them toward their giftings for the furtherance of the kingdom, for His glory. Thank you, Lord. He gives us breath in our lungs to sing His praise. And maybe even to testify every once in a while. Or maybe quite often. Open our eyes, Lord, to our calling. Open our eyes to the calling and our young people. From the youngest to the oldest, God, just stir it up in us what you have for us. Lead us, guide us. God, help us. Just give us the discipline to turn off the phone every once in a while and just seek your face and listen for your still, small voice. The breath that you put in our lungs, let it return to you as praise, God. You give life, you are love, you bring light to darkness, you give hope. I love this. You restore every heart that is broken. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore, you restore. 
restore every heart that is broken. Sing, great are you, Lord. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope Every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our love. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. Shout your praise. God's word says that if we don't praise him, the rocks are going to cry out on our behalf. He's going to get his praise. But ain't no rocks crying out for me. Let's make that our commitment. Ain't no rocks crying out for me. We're going to give you praise, Lord, where praise is due. will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing and great come on church are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing come on and great We'll shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Praise are you more. One more time. The top of your lungs. And all the earth will shout your praise. honor to you, Lord. All praise and honor to you.
It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. I'm in church. Hello, is this good? All right. Hey, um, if you guys would be seated um, for just a moment, um, I go ahead and stand up real quick. So this is this is Mia Hahn. Uh, man, she's coming to get baptized this morning. She is she is uh, coming coming um, has a uh, I, I, I confess Jesus as her Lord and Savior, and um, and um, that's something to celebrate. Amen. And so. Uh, yeah, go ahead and, yeah, amen. And so, man, I, something that I love to do just for baptisms, um, for just as her church family, uh, would you just um, just uh, stretch out your hand to her and um, we're just going to pray for, just for blessing and just for, just for the Holy Spirit to encounter her. And so, God, we thank you for Mia. Father, we thank you for just the sweet salvation, God, that you have given her and, God, that you have given us. And, Father, I pray, God, just not just um, just for water baptism, but, God, we ask you, God, just for the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. And, God, we ask you, Lord Jesus, God, that you would fill her with power, God, that that just as she goes to school tomorrow morning, God, that that um, she would just begin to see you move in her classrooms, God, just um, in her home, in her family, in her friends. And, Father, um, that you would just use her, God, for um, uh, mighty things. And God, God, uh, we bless her. God, we we uh, just say, God, that uh, you're a good God, and that um, thank you for for loving her. And God, and um, we say all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hamia, have you asked to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Awesome. Well, on that profession of faith in me, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Raise the walk in victorious life. Amen. Somebody give a shout of praise in this place. my end. There you go. Here we go. Here we go. Awesome. So exciting to watch that happen and, and so perfectly timed to be having that and then going into what I'm going to preach on today. I, w- I do want to tell you because I think that I just want to make sure that nobody misses out. This coming Saturday night will be our Lotus Women's Night, October the 7th in the Fellowship Hall at 630 we need you to, to please let us know because that's a catered, that's a catered deal. So uh, on, your, on your handouts there, you, you have a note there. Just circle that so that you can remember to call the office and let us know this week because that's going to drive me crazy. What is that? Is there a helicopter landing on our building or is it just me? Maybe it's just me. Okay. Well, I'm going to try to tune it out. But the Lotus thing... Please sign up for that. And then here's the other deal. Men, they're, we're supposed to show up and serve at that. So you be here and, and we'll serve them. There it goes. Whatever that was, that's the stuff. Way to go. 
So that's the Saturday night. So don't forget about that. Now, I'm going to get, I want to get into this because over the next few weeks, I'm going to be teaching on the topic of baptism. The, the, the idea of baptism, there, there's either, it seems like there's either one of two extremes. There's either a lot of confusion, and if you didn't know there was a lot of confusion, don't worry, I'm going to take you there and show you that there is. Or there's uh, an oversimplicity understanding of it. Both of those extremes are, are not, not where God wants us to be. He wants us to have an understanding of, of the deeper concepts. And so I'm going to teach over the, the, the idea of baptism, understanding it. Whenever I go into a series like this, it always, please stay with me on this, it always has such great potential for divisiveness. If you'll hear me as I teach this, this is, the, this is one of the main concepts that God has instructed us not to be divided over. So even when we have a difference of understanding with people, that does not make us have to, be, have to part ways with people. God, in and of itself, who, the person of Jesus Christ, He is a drawer of people. When we have a stance, especially a doctrinal, a theological stance, please hear me say this, that divides us from the rest of the body of Christ, we're wrong in our stance. You understand what I'm saying? That's wrong. God's never going to go be a part of that, ever. You can, you can have a difference of opinion on things and still be greatly in love. For example, my wife and I, she, she likes chocolate. I don't like chocolate, but I like her a lot. And I will get that girl as much chocolate as she wants. I like her. We don't, it doesn't, chocolate's not a divisive thing for us. It does, it's not, it doesn't draw us apart. Neither should baptism. And so I want to say over the next few weeks, as I, as I paint this picture, there are definitely some dividing, under, some, some divisions in understanding on this topic. It is your obligation and my obligation to pursue unity. So I want to teach to some deep things, but I want you to hear me say up front, you are obligated to pursue unity in your faith with other believers. And so with that being said, as I start this, I want, to, I want you to just to pray with me. And I just want to pray an anointing to cover this teaching for us. But hear me, I want to pray an anointing to cover the teachings on the other churches in our community too. That all of our teaching would draw us together as one body. That's God's plan. That's His will. So let's agree for that. So, Father, we come to you and we say, Holy Spirit, bring a spirit of revelation into this room to teach us some of the deeper things that you, in, you intended for us to understand through the Scriptures. God, I am asking you that you don't let this just be a teaching that goes out without any impact but you let understanding be deep-seated, deep-rooted in us, and that understanding draw us deeper to you, which will unify us as a body, not only as, as a body here in the river, but as a, body of the, as, the, as a part of the body of Christ in our community. We want to pursue relationship with the rest of the body because we recognize our oneness. So, Father, I declare in front of this church I recognize our oneness with the other churches in the community. We are one body. We have some differences that, that allow us to meet a little bit separate, but that's not bad either. We are one, and so we pray a covering over this message and a covering over every other message that's going out in our community today. Bless them and bless their services, Holy Spirit. Fill them up and give them an incredible time today. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So baptism, the, it, baptism comes from the Greek word, from the Greek word baptizo, which means, here's the definition of baptizo, because people even have differences in, in this understanding, which again, not to divide, to unite, 
But here's what, here's what the teaching uh, or the meaning of baptizo is. It means to make whelmed, to overwhelm, to immerse or to submerge. That's just the definition of the word. When you have that, de- when, you, when you accept that definition of the word, what that does is that immediately begins to divide you from some other believers that don't believe that it means to, to literally immerse. In this church, we believe that baptism is to literally immerse. Again, just giving you understanding. And this is why we believe that. Because of the definition of the Greek word is to overwhelm or to immerse or to submerge. Now, while I'm here, I want to say one other thing because I get asked about it often. We do not baptize babies here. We dedicate babies. But when we dedicate babies, honestly, that's more of a situation for parents than it is for the child. When we do a baby dedication, it does nothing to seal that child. It has nothing to do with that child's salvation. Nothing whatsoever. When we dedicate, what we're doing is we're acknowledging that God has blessed these parents with this child. And we're coming around as a body to say, we extend the arm. We say, hey, we come into communion with you. We come into agreement with you. We want to be a part of being your family. And we will hold you accountable to doing what you are committing to do in raising this child. And that's what we believe the baby dedication thing is all about. But we do not baptize. And the reason we do not baptize is because baptism always comes after a decision. Okay? People have some differences, and it's not a divide, not to divide, just again to give you understanding. So that's the reason we don't do baby dedications here, because we believe that even after we do a, I mean, we don't do baby baptisms, but we believe that after we dedicate a baby, that baby still has to grow up and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's still, it's still that child's responsibility to accept Christ. So here's just a side note. Little, little bit of a hard side note, but I, I got to say it for my benefit. When you dedicate your child and then you have no active involvement in teaching that child the principles of God, you haven't done anything good for that child. You are committing, when you dedicate that child, you are committing to raise that child to know the Lord. And it's not the church's responsibility to raise your babies to know Jesus. It's your responsibility. So when you dedicate that child, and then if you don't, if you don't follow that by teaching that child to walk in the ways of God, you haven't done anything for that child. Because here we, here's what I want you, here's the hard part. If Jesus isn't a big deal in your walk, it won't matter what you talk every now and then. Your babies are watching not just what you're saying, they're watching what you're doing. And if God isn't a factor in your walk, it doesn't matter if you sprinkle a little Jesus on your talk every now and then. It is truth. I mean, you have to teach your children. And then we come along and help. This is why baptism is a big deal. And here's the deal. I want you to understand the the thing about baptism, especially here as I'm talking about this, water baptism, what you just saw me do. Water baptism. Listen to me. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Mia Church, Mia is not going to heaven because of what she just did. She's going to heaven because she accepted Christ. And what she just did is the first step that we are called to walk in that following of Christ. Now, I don't have this passage to put up on the screen. But as I was just looking over, I I wrote it down. Because I want to take my time and point out to you passages of Scripture that people use to, to make to, to draw a little bit of division so that I can acknowledge it, but hopefully come along behind it and bring you some teaching so that you have some understanding. 
one of the passages of Scripture that people use to say, no, 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 you have to do that. You have to be water baptized in order to go to heaven comes from Mark chapter 16. Listen to these two verses. Mark chapter 16 verse 14 says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and the hardness of their heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's what the word says. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So people take that one verse and they build this doctrine off of that one verse that says you have to, you have to be saved and baptized in order to, you have to, you have to accept Christ and be baptized in order to be saved. It says it right there. Listen to me. That's because we live in a culture that is doing everything it can to parse this thing apart. We're trying to divide this thing apart so that reality, so that we can do what is minimally required of us to squeak into heaven. That's why we have the understanding of that passage. Because that passage is not teaching that you have to, you have to accept Christ and then be baptized in order to get to heaven. Although it says... That's what it says. But the reason it's saying that is because the Bible nowhere intended on people to accept Christ and then not be baptized. That's a societal thing. We, hey, I want to accept Christ. I don't want to be baptized. They're, they're, but hear me. Stay with me. There's a problem with that. And I want to show you. I know some of you are like, Mark. Hmm. <clears throat> <clears throat> That's, I'll save the story. I don't think water will help, but I'll take it. Thank you. Some of you are going, wait, wait, Mark. You cannot say that water baptism is a part of salvation because it says right there that it is. Listen, I can, and here's why. You can't build, you have to let Scripture, uh, you have to let the Scripture complete the Scripture. You have to draw depths out of, out of bringing passages together. And when you take one passage of Scripture like that and you build a theology around it that says if you don't get baptized, water baptized, you're not going to heaven. If you do that, there are so many passages of Scripture that you can be in real trouble. And, and I want to tell you, not because Mark said you dig on your own, but I, but I want to tell you, the thing that saves you, the thing that takes you to heaven, because you're either going to live forever in heaven or forever in hell. The only thing that will make that decision for you is your accepting Christ. That's it. Nothing else can change that. It's not a matter of, of being water baptized. And you say, yeah, but why does that verse say that? Again, church, because that verse Never was there any understanding that people would, would accept Christ and then not follow him. So that verse is saying, this is what it looks like to be saved. You accept him and then you follow him. Stay with me and I'll keep showing you some stuff. In Matthew chapter 10. Choosing to follow Christ. Now, let me say this to you. For a bunch of you, I'm about to teach you some things that are going to be troubling to your spirit. Because accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior is a very public matter. If you think you can accept Him as your Savior and not change any part of your life, I want to be clear to you, that's not salvation. That is a false hope that will lead you someday to standing in front of the King of Kings and hearing these words to you. Depart from me, for I never knew you. I have to be, I have to be strong on this so that you understand. If you think you can accept him and it not change your actions and not be a, a public matter, you're wrong, you're mistaken. Let me show you. Matthew chapter 10. Look at verse 32. Therefore, Whoever confesses me before men, 
him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever, church, denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. I'm just, that's a troubling, troubling thing for a lot of people in their faith. Why? Because our society says, hey, we don't talk about, we don't talk about politics and we don't talk about religion. Just rouse too many people up. Ah, you don't have that option. You don't have that option, church. You have, it has to be a consuming thing. And, and, and I know some of you are troubled with that, but I'm telling you, to accept Christ and then to never profess that, never proclaim that in your life is a false understanding of salvation. It is. Stay with me. Verse 34. This is Jesus talking. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. That's what this is. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves his father, his mother, more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life here on earth, he who finds his life there will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Church, I'm just telling you, this passage is teaching that when we accept Christ and we, and we, uh, we accept him into our heart as our Savior, that life changes. If you think you can have a private faith, that you don't ever talk about God, I, look, I don't want to follow all that public stuff. I don't want to do all that. I'm telling you, you have a false understanding of salvation. One more passage. I want to back, back up to verse 27 now and show you so that you understand this. Chapter 10, verse 27. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops do not fear those who will kill the body and and cannot kill the soul but rather listen rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell it, he's saying to you and i hey listen this is a big deal you cannot accept me and then not ever let anybody around. Hey, I just want to accept the Lord. I don't really want to follow him. I don't really want to get baptized. I don't really want to talk about it publicly. I don't really. It makes me think of that commercial. You've seen that. Uh, I think it's mutual, some kind of car insurance. And the lady says, you know, I wrecked my car. And they only wanted to pay for three quarters of my car. What am I supposed to do? Drive around on three quarters of a car? And then she says, go to these other great people because they want to pay for your whole car. That's smart. You should drive a whole car. And every time I hear that commercial, I think, but that's the cry of the church. The church goes, hey, I'd like a quarter of salvation, please. I just want a quarter of salvation. I don't want to do that whole public thing. I don't want to really get out in front of people. I don't want to really No, church. This verse says what you hear in the ear, get up on your rooftops and proclaim. You don't have an option. I don't want to be publicly incorrect. I don't want to talk about, you don't have that option. Deny me before men and I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. That's what our King of Kings said. Now, I don't blame y'all for being quiet. Because nobody wants to hear that. That does not mean, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> puberty. <clears throat> that does not mean you have to carry your Bible around and you have to be whack people over the head and be some bullhorn, repent, go to hell, blah, blah. No, no, no. The way you preach the best, the best message is to live this life. But if you think you can follow him without following him, you're not really following him. Man, it's a, it's a big deal, church. It's a big 
big deal. So baptism, what does this look like? Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> Flip over a couple of chapters. Look at Matthew chapter 28. I want to show you that following him is a very public issue. Matthew chapter 28, look at verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away down to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, listen, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen, if you don't read that passage every once in a while over yourself and remind yourself of who, he, who has your back, because this life, man, this life will kick all the life out of you. It's hard. But that's why when Jesus said, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like when we get feeble and we feel like we're going to crumble, you, you read this verse and it's like him picking you up and going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, I have all authority in heaven and earth. Nothing has authority over you. I have authority over it all. And everywhere you go, I got you. That's what he's saying in this passage. And he's teaching us to do three things. To make disciples, to baptize them, and to teach them to observe all that he had commanded. Here's the problem. Back to that commercial. I guess they don't want you to have three quarters of a car. Or drive three quarters of a car. I guess they don't want us to have a quarter of faith. That's why we have to do it all. We accept him. We get baptized. Hey, it doesn't matter if you think it's a good idea or not. The fact that our society has turned that baptism water into something that only kids do, that's like a cute part of the service, that's how we follow him. And I say that, listen, I say that to you because I have conversations with adults all the time. I, I know, I know, man, some of you are going, oh, great, he's talking about me. There's a whole bunch of you, just trust me. I have conversations with adults all the time that are like, hey, I just haven't ever done that. Man, I'm just kind of, kind of, we're not made to have a quarter of faith. You don't get to skip that part. Eh, I don't think I want that part. No, no, no. That's the first and most important part. That's why we watch a child when they grow. We watch them whenever they start standing up and they're all wobbly. Why? Because we want to see that first step. We want to see that. That first step. Listen, some there are people that have been that have accepted the Lord 50 years ago and still aren't walking. Because you haven't taken the first step. Those baptism waters are not a kid thing, church. Those baptism waters are a sanctifying, set us apart. The only I wish you heard what I'm saying. The only way you'll ever follow Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, as the King of your forever, is to do things His way. And that's step one. If you haven't done step one, you haven't done step any. Because you can't do it your way. You have to do it His way. He says, make disciples, baptize them, and then look, teaching them to follow. The reason this is a big deal to us is I, I struggle with, with this is a public profession of faith. That's a small part of it. It's a small part, but hear me. If you think that those baptism waters are simply a public profession of faith, you have too small of a picture of baptism. Hear me. Let me tell you why. You can't even learn to follow his ways until you do that. Because Jesus said, make disciples, baptize them, and then teach them to observe my ways. I'm just telling you, we ought to, in the next few weeks, have a baptism service where we baptize like 50 adults. 
Because if you haven't followed him in step one, you haven't followed him in step any. And I know that that's troubling. And I know some of you are like, can you think of a nicer way to put it? I wish I could. (laughs) I'd love to. Church. Because this is ultimately what it comes down to. That's embarrassing. And I don't want to get baptized because I don't want people to know I've never done it. Look, I listen, stay with me. Deny me before men, and I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. You decide if it's a big deal. You see, there comes a point where as bad as it, as bad as it sounds, church, at some point, Jesus, he's for you, man. He loves you. He never wants to hurt you. He never wants to bring anything bad into your life. But if you think he's concerned about you being embarrassed, He's not. He's just not. And the reason that we don't see more of the, of the manifestations and of the powerful things that he has called us to walk in is because we simply don't want to follow his ways. And so what that does is that brings an arrogance into our life and we, sit and we are truly saying, I don't want all that mess, but I dang sure don't want to go to hell. So just accept me and leave me be. just saying to you that's not a biblical picture of salvation church it requires action on our parts so why is there so much confusion about baptism that's a great question and I'm so glad you asked some of you may go wait a minute I didn't know there was any confusion on baptism well I want to confuse you real quick I really don't want to confuse you but I do want to tell you why here's the deal no one knows what you have in your heart No one knows. No one knows if you're going to heaven or not. Only you and God. There is a sanctifying. Sanctification is just a big church word that that simply means this. uh, Separation. And whenever we accept Christ as our Savior, 100% of the time, biblically, He always has intended to sanctify us, to separate us, to set us apart. Why? Because we have a a job at that point. The scripture says, you are a royal nation, a holy priesthood. You see, that's why what Pastor Tori is doing back there with our teenagers, with our little kids, is so important because she's teaching them that they're royalty. Listen, the reason that we don't move in the things of God is because we were never taught that we're, ro- that we're a royal nation, that we are a holy priesthood. You guys think, maybe not you specifically, probably people outside. Y'all are too smart to think this. But a lot of church people think ministry stuff is for the guys on the stage. It's because you, you just haven't read your Bible. Ministry is for you. The guys on the stage are supposed to equip you to do the ministry. That's the way it works. And so the reason that it's not happening and the reason that we don't see revival like we talk about whenever we want to be really churchy is because simply the ministers aren't ministering. And the reason the ministers aren't ministering is because the ministers don't want to follow his way. Why? Because it's a little bit too sanctifying. It puts me out in front of people and it makes me look like, holy moly, yep, that's his plan. That's why he said, Oh, by the way, after you get these truths, stand on the top of your roof and proclaim to everyone around that he's your king and that he's who you follow. I've already ruffled your feathers enough. Let me do it one more, one more step farther. Probably over the line. Here it is. That's why. I, I, know, I know some people are going to have real trouble with this, but please forgive me. That's why it's a problem. When people are like, I just, I'm not very expressive in my worship. You're not very expressive in your worship. Because you're not convinced of what he's done for you. 
You see, once you get convinced that you were literally going to burn in an eternal hell, and this king of kings that never, never sinned, stepped out of perfection onto this rotten earth and was pinned to a cross by you and I because of your sins and mine, all of a sudden when that reality invades your brain, you don't mind losing yourself and lifting your hands or worshiping or whatever. I'm not saying you got to lift your hands, but... And I, that, listen, that's, ter- that's troubling. The reason that's troubling is because you just haven't bought fully in. You don't really know. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You can't sing that song because you don't know. You don't even believe you were ever lost. The reality is when you believe and you recognize, oh, my gosh, doesn't matter if my papa ran around and preached about the Bible. One day I was on my way to hell, but this king of kings has changed my eternal destiny. I get to follow him. When that invades your heart, all of a sudden, hey, I just don't do that, loses itself. And all of a sudden you become the guy on your face and you don't care who sees because you've got a king that has stepped out of glory and saved you. And you know what it means to be able to say, I want some amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. One day I was lost, but today I'm found. I used to be blind, but today I see. See, that, that's, that's more than just a song, church. That's a, that's a life motto. And so following him, accepting him, and then pursuing his ways, it, it's just we have to at some point, I'm, I'm almost done. We have to understand that, that at some point we have to do it his way. We don't get to do it our way. I promise you, that this is going to show you all how old I am. But I promise y'all, for y'all old people like me, when Sonny Bono died and he stood in front of the King of Kings, I promise you he wasn't singing over the rainbow. He may have been crying. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry that I did it my way. And the Lord wants us to understand we have to do it his way. We have to follow and do it his way, church. That's why there's a progression in Matthew 28. Make a a decision on the inside and then baptize them. That's where the public profession of faith comes in. Look, that's partly right. But listen, the reason that's not all that is, I'm going to wrap up with this. Listen. The reason that is not only a public profession of faith is because you cannot learn to walk in his ways without doing that. So it's not just some cute thing that little kids do to go, oh, look what we did. We baptized these. No, no, no. That's, that's how you sign up to follow his ways. Without that, you can't follow his ways. It's, it's a sanctifying. It's a setting apart. It is a, it, is a, it is a thing that causes us to be able to walk in the fullness of who he is. Now, here's... Here's the good bad news. That's just the beginning. I haven't even talked about the controversial part of baptism yet. That's next week. Next week, I'm going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Woo! Yes. People's heads will maybe spin. People will probably be falling out on the floor. We're going to hand out snakes. God. If anybody brings a snake in here, I'm the first guy to leave the room. (laughs) If I have to pick one up, I have the biblical authority to, but Jesus is going to have to tell me to. I'm only saying to you, it's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not weird, church. I'm going to show you next week that there are three baptisms in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ Then the body baptizes us in the water, which separates us to be able to pursue God. And then Jesus Christ baptizes us into the Holy Spirit in fire. And that's what allows us to walk in the fullness of who we are. It's not crazy. You never see my head spin, nor will you see anybody else's. So come next week ready to hear and to learn what the Bible teaches about this. But I want you to stand with me today because I want to close this service out with some understanding.
We're going to pray, and we're going to do communion, give you a chance to come take communion, because this is how we, this is how we show that we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. But hear me. I want you to listen, because I don't want to fully let you off the hook. There's a lot of adults. Please, those of you that I've talked to, please don't think I'm not hammering you publicly. I've talked to a bunch of you, but listen to me. Please listen to me. I'm not teaching you right if I don't tell you with great importance how important this step is. And church, there's a church full of adults that need to need to get in these waters and recognize that this is no kid thing. That you need to allow yourself to be sanctified so that you can walk through these baptism waters and you can step into step one of what his plan is for you for your life. If you've never been baptized, hey, you need to come talk to me. We gotta set this, we gotta get this thing straight. It's a big deal, church. So let's take communion. If you want to come talk to me about that, if you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior, please come talk to me about that. Let's get that issue nailed down. So you guys, let's take communion and make your way back to your seat and then we'll be, we'll be dismissed. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Evil may put up his strongest fight the cross has the final word the cross has the final word the cross has the final word the savior has come with the morning light, the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. He traded death for eternal life. The cross has. Nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. There's nothing stronger. Nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. So much truth. All the glory, all the honor, all the power to the name of Jesus. There is nothing stronger, nothing higher. Nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Oh, 
See, I'm going to pick back up here and I'm going to, I'm going to start this teaching and, and then I'm going to get into, you know, the different parts of baptism and why there's, con- why there's confusion and difficulty and we'll talk about that. But next week, we will have a sign up here for baptisms. And then the next week, we're going to actually do uh, a baptism service. And so I, I believe... We're going to baptize a lot of people. And so in next week, if you'll come back next week, we'll have a place for you to actually sign up. And then the next week, we're going to baptize people. And it's going to be an awesome time. It's going to be a sanctifying day. We are going to set us apart to really go after him. And so I want you to, to be mindful of that and to be ready for that. Just because I know that there's probably a lot of questions, but that's it. Next week. Well, I'll finish this. This teaching is going to last a, a few more weeks, but next week we'll sign up, and then in two weeks we'll actually do some baptisms. Sure. All right, church. Sorry about that. What a great day in the house of the Lord today. Amen. All right, a couple of announcements. Um, Mark told you about the the women's banquet just to give you a little more of a teaser to want to come. We're going to have Reagan's Brick Oven Pizza here to make pizzas. And if you've never had Reagan's Brick Oven Pizzas, they're awesome. So ladies, you'll want to sign up for that. Call the office this week. Um, We really need a good hard count by Tuesday. So call Monday and Tuesday and let us get that in. Um, uh, Then guys, men's retreat is not this coming weekend, but it's next weekend. So if you haven't signed up, you're pushing it, so call the office and let's get signed up. Man, it's going to be a great time of fellowship with our guys in Red River. So call about that. If you have signed up, we'll get some information out this week on um, getting up there and try to get everybody carpooling so uh, you don't have to make that long drive by yourself. Uh, last but not least, we just finished our second Cubits class, which is awesome. But next week at 9 o'clock, we're going to start a prophetic class. So we're, I've got a little video to show. If you'll just take a look, it's really short. Prophecy doesn't just call out the future in somebody. It has the ability to transform them back into the person they were called to be. And that's our job. This is your mission if you should receive it. That we'd find treasures, hidden treasures, in secret places of darkness. We would call out those treasures and it would transform people back to the person that they were called to be so that they could fulfill their calling and their destiny and touch the earth with the kingdom of God. All right. So that starts at 9 o'clock next Sunday. The cost for the book's $10. If you haven't signed up already, there's a sign-up sheet in the information table in the fellowship hall. Please let us know so we can have those books together. It'll be a powerful class. Last but not least, Calvin's in the back, back there by the window. Wave, Calvin. If you're a first-time visitor with us, we want to give you a gift. Go back there and fill out a card so we can have your information and get a gift from us. 
Church, go out and have a great week. Love you guys.